Hey there, and welcome back to Mutant Year Zero. My name is Pete, and today we complete episode 7 of our Iron Mutant playthrough. In the last episode, we headed south to the Iron Serpent, took a quick detour to the Scraplands afterwards, gathered a bunch of valuables, and also collected another artifact. Today, we are starting things off with that artifact, or rather with the two of them that we currently have, as we head over to Prip's place. Good to see you again. Here we can now unlock the Ranger upgrade, a 1 point damage increase to every single weapon that we have, or will have in the future, and the boost extends to critical damage as well. Very, very powerful, and I recommend grabbing this upgrade as quickly as possible. Have a swell time out there. Up next, we are stopping by Deltas again, as we have another weapon to upgrade. Hey, what can I help you with? Now, scrolling down the list, we can see that we have two slinger rifles, as well as a gaper that we will likely never use again. So, I think we can dismantle one of the two rifles alongside the gaper. Both will earn us 17 scrap each, advancing our total to 93. And 93, that is enough for both a level 2 and a level 3 upgrade. And coincidentally, Dux's trusty boomstick is still at level 1. So let's take it to level 3 right away for a damage output of up to 15 points with a critical hit. And again, Dux can get those pretty regularly. Take it easy. One final stop then before we head out. Time to visit Iridia. I was a stalker for 20 years. Spent quite some time out there. One night we were south of the Ark on patrol. We went inside an ancient building that was filled with grog. Giant metal vats of grog. When we drank it, we thought we died and went to space. I could never find that place again, no matter how hard I tried. Now, we don't want to do much here and only purchase a single EMP grenade. If things go according to plan, we probably won't even need it, but we have more than enough scrap at the moment, and it might come in handy. Later, Gator. And there we go, let us now take a look at the squad and loadout for today's episode. And we are continuing where we left off last time, with Dux, Bormin and Magnus, who will actually play a vital role today. Bormin, meanwhile, will be the carrier of not one, but two EMP grenades, together with Hogrush and Twitchshot. Magnus's loadout remains the same as last time, Chain Lightning is what we need him for today, so let's make sure he has that. Finally then, we have Dux, now with the level 3 boomstick and also with the Aristo hat, at least for the first half of the mission. Ability-wise, we are going with Mothwing, Circuit Breaker and Alpinist, once again, at least for now. Before we head out, we can also quickly unlock two more mutations, starting with Eagle Eye on Bormin. In my opinion, this is pretty much a no-brainer, a 25% range increase will never not be useful, and it also leaves him with only two more mutations to unlock. With Magnus, meanwhile, we can grab Run and Gun, not that we really need it at the moment, but it clears the path for two very powerful mutations down the line. And that's it, time to finally head out into the zone. Our destination today are the metal fields further south, and since we already unlocked them for fast traveling last time, we can now go there immediately. Now, the opening area here is rather straightforward with just a few piles of scrap, but things will get more interesting very, very soon. Hey guys, look over there in the really big ruin. Someone's in trouble. Oh, grog me. Check out that stone cold fox. What is she doing out here? And why are those machines surrounding her? We gotta help her. Alright, looks like we have found ourselves another mutant, all alone in the zone. And in theory, we could rescue her right here and now. But in my opinion, a good rescue mission includes a bit of combat. So let's get everyone up onto the train here to take out the police bot patrolling the area. It takes a few moments until Borman and Magnus have climbed up, and we definitely want to wait until they're in position. In the meantime though, we can catch another glimpse of that fox in the shadows, before we then eventually begin the ambush. And this first fight is quite simple. Dux has a guaranteed critical hit due to firing from above. That had to hurt. 
the high ground also gives Borman two guaranteed hits with Twitch Shot. One of them is another critical, so it seems like the two shots can have different results after all. And that makes the kill rather easy for Magnus. Now, moving on, we will stay on the train for a little while longer, as it gives us a great shot at the next group of enemies. Interestingly enough, they are more robots. To be more precise, a police bot enforcer with 30 hit points and 2 points of armor, accompanied by two regular bots like the one we just took out. Report to the evacuation area for processing. With Dux and Borman hidden up top, we want to move Magnus down onto the ground again. He needs to be just a little closer for our plan to work. That plan, however, begins with Borman and an EMP grenade, as we are now, for the first time in this series, I believe, engaging three enemies at the same time. The grenade stuns them for a few turns, boosted by the upgrade that we grabbed from Prips a while back. And at this point, all we need to do is fire away to slowly but steadily decimate their health bars. Being on the high ground and still hidden thanks to the enemies being stunned, Ducks should also be able to land a few criticals during all of this, which is a great way to compensate for the slightly better protection of the Enforcer, while Magnus and Borman focus on the bots in the back. And because that is pretty much all there is to say about this fight strategy-wise, let's briefly talk achievements instead. Yeah, I that. What do you think about that, huh? as these three here are mechanical enemies number 9, 10 and 11 that we are disposing of in this playthrough. Gotcha. For the anti-mechanic achievement, however, we only need 10, so that one will be the first achievement of today's episode, and it will unlock at the end of this fight here. That fight itself, meanwhile, is also a good example of the downsides of that knockback effect on Dux's pistol. Don't get stupid! As you can see, he has now pushed the Enforcer back two tiles from its original starting position, and because we invested in critical hit upgrades on his weapon instead of range increases, we actually have to move Ducks up to stay in range. Combined with the fact that we also occasionally have to spend an action point to reload, this unfortunately wastes one of his moves, and of course the stun only lasts so long. Still, eventually we will have all enemies below 11 hit points before their stun wears off, Bingo. And that means it is now Magnus's time to shine. Using Chain Lightning, we can do up to 11 points of damage, ignoring armor completely, and the lightning jumps from enemy to enemy, allowing Magnus to kill them all in one swift motion. And like I said, that unlocks the anti-mechanic achievement, while Magnus simultaneously also increases the counter for another achievement, namely the one that is awarded for killing 10 enemies with chain lightning. Now among the robot loot we conveniently find another EMP grenade, and also very conveniently, chain lightning will immediately be usable again in the next fight, since we killed 3 enemies with it and it only has a cooldown of 2 kills. If a loved one is experiencing symptoms, report them to the nearest police bot. Now boarding for the time is 6.19. A few piles of scrap later, we then encounter the next enforcer, this time all on its own and patrolling. And while we learn that these bots were apparently used to at least attempt to handle the disease that this game refers to, which is still a bit weird given the current global situation, we can once again make our way onto another train. Up here we find some weapon parts and can then also launch our ambush from above. And just like in our first fight, we are starting things off with ducks, this time, however, to use Circuit Breaker, because it might take two turns to take the enemy out. Our luck depends entirely on Bormin and his Twitch Shot, and unfortunately this time he does not get a critical, so we have to take a regular shot with Magnus before we can then zap the enemy on the next turn. With a critical from Borman, we could have killed the bot in one turn using only abilities, which would have unlocked another achievement, but we still have plenty of time to grab that elsewhere. Regroup. Now back down we go to collect some more weapon parts, and we can also already spot the next police bot in the building ahead of us. 
looks like a place you get processed in. I'm not a number. I'm a free duck. The third of those hidden magazines can also be found in the bushes over here, and then it is time to proceed into phase two of this mission, which includes a few minor changes with ducks. He will now switch back to the fertility crown and also activate his silent assassin mutation for the first time. We are done with the high ground for now, so we need to get our critical bonuses elsewhere. The poly spot, meanwhile, is arguably the easiest target of this mission. All other enemies on the map, and there are still a few, are pretty far away, so we can safely go loud with the boomstick and our two Rambinos, which allows us to kill the enemy without the use of a single ability. Inside the house then we only have a bit more scrap as well as an exit to another area on the other side, but we won't go there just yet, you'll see the reason in just a moment. Instead we can advance between the two trains here, where we also quickly encounter our next enemy, but before we engage let's loot the trains themselves, both the one on the left as well as the one on the right have some valuables inside of them, most notably another EMP grenade, that we can actually grab from the outside of the train, and I'm not entirely sure if that was intended to be possible. Stay in line. Keep moving. Just as we are done collecting everything, a second enforcer then arrives as part of its patrol routine, and that gives us an excellent opportunity to once again take out two enemies in one go, starting with yet another EMP grenade. At this point you might also see why we purchased an extra one earlier, back in the Ark. So far we have not needed it, as the map itself offers a good amount of them as loot, but that is only if things go according to plan and the enemies are killed in the correct order if you will. Now somewhat carelessly I also forgot to switch Magnus back to the crossbow and actually use the Rambino to fire with him here. But luckily the rest of the enemies, yes there are still a handful left, are once again too far away to notice. Before you ask though, yes robots will react to loud noises the same way that human enemies do, so just to be on the safe side we are switching everyone back to silent weapons from here on out. Like I said, the map is not entirely cleared just yet. Had to hurt. Our goal in this fight is once again to get both enemies to 11 hit points or below, so that Magnus can use his chain lightning for the kill. Mathematically speaking, using it at the beginning of the fight would actually be better, as we would receive the maximum amount of damage possible from it. But thanks to the stun from the EMP grenade, we have a bit of a leeway and can focus on the achievement instead. Does that hurt? That achievement, by the way, will be unlocked later this episode, just not in this fight. Not gonna warn you again. With this shot from Magnus, we are now ready for the zap, so let's add two more kills to the counter and wrap up the fight. Positioning-wise, we are now more or less back to where we started. The loot from that first poly spot is still sitting here, waiting to be collected. It turns out to be another weapon modification, this one with a 100% chance to knock back enemies, so basically the same effect as the Gaper that we dismantled earlier, giving us one more good reason to have done that, as we can now replicate the effect on basically every other weapon in the game. That mysterious fox is also still waiting for her rescue. I think though that she will have to wait for a little while longer, as we make our way through another train to collect a bit more loot, then back out to collect some more, and eventually into another firefight with a lone poly spot that should not offer too much resistance.
For this one, we are starting things off with a Mothwing circuit breaker combination, since we can't get onto any of the trains here. Borman's Hog Rush would work as well, as we only need to incapacitate the enemy for one turn, but I feel that circuit breaker fits the overall theme of the mission a bit better. <laughs> yeah. Very importantly, we also do not want to use Magnus' Chain Lightning on this bot, even though we could, since we killed two enemies with it earlier. Hurt, don't it? But there is one more group of enemies waiting that we want to save it for. Ah! All in all, this fight is once again a pretty short and lopsided affair, but then again, that is exactly what it should be. With the bot defeated, we can now proceed through the next train wagon, grab a bit more loot, and then get ready for the final fight of the mission. For this one, we also want to use another EMP grenade, and looking through Borman's inventory, we can now confirm that we do in fact have one extra, so that purchase back at the Ark would not have been necessary. If you are wondering, by the way, what these enemies are capable of offensively, since we never really let things come to that, the regular police bots have a little stun gun that doesn't do much damage but incapacitates, just like our circuit breaker does, while the enforcers are using, I believe, boomstick shotguns themselves, and also have jetpacks, allowing them to get up close and do a good amount of damage. As you can imagine though, for this last fight we do not want to experience any of that on our mutant friends, so let's wait until the two robots are in a straight line and launch another EMP grenade, the blast radius is just large enough to affect and stun them both. From here on out, the process is then quite simple. One more time, we want to wear our enemies down to 11 hit points or less, but this time we can use loud weapons, since these two are the last enemies on the map. Knock. Especially the boomstick will make quick work of the bot's health bars, and so in just a moment we can launch one last lightning strike. And yes, I will admit, with the map being full of robots, the combat in this episode was likely not always super engaging. Now it's getting fun. But this is an attempt of thoroughly completing the game on its highest difficulty setting, so I hope you found some entertainment in the meticulousness of it all. There is actually also still a discussion to be had regarding a set of conflicting achievements that will eventually force us to make a choice between continuing to take no damage whatsoever and maybe even losing one of our squad members, but we'll get to that in a bit. In any case, another chain lightning is ready to go. And with it, we have now officially killed 10 enemies using this mutation, which unlocks the Frying Tonight achievement. I'm really starting to dislike the Metal Men. Let's get to Hammond post-haste. Magnus then reminds us of our mission to find Hammond, but let's collect some more goodies first, and let's also not forget about that fox that we came to rescue. Thanks for the help. Not that I needed help, I was just getting my second wind, you know, but... I admire your fighting skills. You need skills like that in the zone. Especially against air control machines that want to quarantine you. Whatever that means. Hey, we're some straight-up machine-killing freaks. That's how we roll. What's your name, lady? The name's Farrow. Don't ask me where I got it from. I don't quite know, really. I was raised in a settlement. Thought it was the only settlement left on the whole wide world. But meeting you lot... makes me feel a bit more, well, hopeful. Who are you? What are you doing out here? We're stalkers from the Ark. We're headed south to rescue our friend from some lunatics called the Nova Sect. Heard of them? You're asking me if I've heard of the Nova Sect? Mate, the Nova Sect butchered my bleeding settlement. They put their mind control junk into the rest and led them away like cattle. I'm the only one that got away. So yeah, I know the Nova Sect. I'm hunting them. I'm gonna make them pay. We need a fighter like you on our side. If you help us save our friend, we'll help you take down the Nova Sect. Okay, so we have recruited another squad member in Pharaoh, unlocking the Survivor achievement, 
and we can now loot her hideout, which includes another note and a narrated one at that. The young subjects are developing faster than we could have imagined. During our journey to the facility, we encountered a squad of rogue enforcers which began firing upon us. The subjects dealt with them effortlessly. The youngsters have exceeded my wildest dreams. If only Central Command wasn't so narrow-minded, the Earth could once again be ours. Alright, so we learn about some young subjects that a certain Ingmar Edison was apparently experimenting on. Very interesting, and I'm sure we'll learn more about this as our journey continues. Bingo! Now for the fun stuff. Very fittingly then, we can also grab a suit of police armor, which increases throwing range for things like grenades and molotovs. Not super useful in my opinion, but it does also offer a healthy amount of protection. For now, we have no need to equip it on anyone, but we do have a few more things to take care of. First of all, with that key that we collected just a moment ago, we want to head back to that half-destroyed building that we did not go through earlier. I also thought myself to be very smart by letting Dux go all alone to then jump back to his friends and save a few seconds, but in a moment you will see that I simply didn't think far enough. Look at those ruins in the distance. They call that the Forbidden City, right? Creepy place. Hope I never have to go there. Well, I'm afraid he will. For the moment though, we can use that key to unlock the gate to the quarantine area, which unfortunately holds nothing but a single medkit, which I think is a little bit disappointing. While we are here though, we might as well unlock another area for fast traveling, as the metal fields are once again leading into multiple new areas, that is also why splitting the party was entirely pointless, as we can of course not keep them separated between two different maps. Now, this area here is called the Castle of Light, and we will not need to go here for quite some time, but once we do, we can travel here easily straight from the Ark, so I think it makes some sense to briefly unlock it at this point. As we now return to the metal fields and head all the way over to the other end of the map, let's quickly talk about that overall direction of the playthrough that I mentioned a few minutes ago. At the moment, we are playing this essentially as a perfect playthrough, taking no damage at all. I also feel very confident in my ability to continue down that path and to at least finish the game with no one dying, which would unlock a rare achievement. However, there is also an achievement for actually losing a squad member, in a very creative way at that, and these two achievement paths kind of compete with each other. So without going into too much detail at this point, perhaps you could let me know which path you would prefer for this playthrough. Again, I think both are very much possible, but unfortunately we have to choose one. Smells like fertilizer. That Novasect base, the Spear of Heaven, I think it's up ahead. Probably where the Novasect is holding Hammond. And so here we are, getting closer and closer to Hammond. Just like Duck said, the next area will take us through some farmland, but after we have cleared out whoever inhabits that place, our next destination could be the Spear of Heaven, where we will hopefully finally find Hammond. I think that is an adventure for another day though, so let's return to the Ark for now. After all, we also have a new squad member that I would like you to meet. Your search for Hammond opens your eyes to an undiscovered country, huh? Wondering if paradise lies beyond the zone? Enclaves filled with happy people? The enclaves are empty. The best and brightest all destroyed themselves. They were only human. What else could they do? The restlessness and rage of the outside world slowly seeped into their hermetically sealed utopias. And soon they were all at war. They all killed each other. For what? Why would they do such a thing? I don't know. Maybe they were bored. There is no paradise beyond the zone. Don't go looking for it. Your home is here. The Ark thanks you for your service. 
be well. Now, it might just be me, but I can't help but feel like the Elder's pleas for us to keep coming back to the Ark and to not ask questions are becoming increasingly insistent, if you will. Which, of course, only strengthens the suspicion that there are certain things out there in the zone that we do not yet know about. However, I don't think that this is the right time to speculate, so let us instead take a closer look at Pharaoh the Fox, our latest crew member. As you can see, she comes equipped with a level 2 boomstick and an EMP grenade, kind of indicating that she might have been useful against all of those robots, and a look at her mutations only confirms that. As her first mutation, we could now grab Circuit Breaker, so with her and Ducks in the squad we could have disabled robots left and right, but instead we are actually going with Sneak, not because we need it, but because it's cheaper. With Silent Assassin, she then gets a critical boosting power, just like Ducks, and of course we want to grab that as well. Now up next comes Pharaoh's bread and butter mutation, Gunslinger. Using this ability, she is able to shoot at multiple targets in one round, albeit at the cost of a decreasing hit chance the more targets are aimed at. Still, we have already found several ways to counteract that, so this is one that we do not want to pass up. The same goes for moth wings, and don't ask me how that works, for ducks it does at least make some sense, but this is one of those ways to negate a hit chance penalty, and for 5 points it is relatively affordable. Now that leaves us with 7 more points to spend, and we are actually using some of those to grab some stat upgrades now, as Pharaoh's upgrades alternate between a health bonus and a crit chance bonus. For 3 points, we can upgrade her health and her crit chance once, which leaves us with 4 more points that I do not want to spend just yet, just to give us a bit more flexibility down the line, should we need it. And that's it, I am very much looking forward to see Pharaoh in action. Again, when that gunslinger mutation works just right, it is an absolute joy to watch, similar to Magnus's chain lightning just blasting through groups of enemies, so if possible, we are taking Pharaoh out into the field very, very soon. For today though, I think we can make the cut at this point. Starting a new mission would make the episode a little too long in my opinion, but next time we might complete two again, depending on how things go of course. So as always, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then I would of course be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.